Hi, everybody. My name is Jason John, one of the chief residents, and I have the next installment of your base camp lecture series, this one covering acute encephalopathy. So on this title slide, I have one of my favorite articles that I share with my wards teams all the time. Um, it is a very funny but very real article from the BMJ 2009 Christmas edition, and it's called Lying Obliquely, a Clinical Sign of Cognitive Impairment. I definitely suggest checking it out. So for this talk, we have a couple learning objectives. Um, first of all, by the end of this talk, I would like you to be able to identify clinical situations where management should be prioritized over diagnosis. Second, I would like you to be able to establish a broad differential diagnosis for acute encephalopathy. Third, I would like you to be able to devise a high yield initial evaluation for uh, undifferentiated acute encephalopathy. And last but not least, I'd like you to be able to use data from an initial evaluation of acute encephalopathy to pursue a focused secondary workup. So in the grand tradition of medical education, let's start with a case. And I would like you to picture for a moment, imagine, if you will, you are a new intern. You arrive to the hospital and get to sign out from your colleague who was on overnight. After signing out patients from the previous day who you know well and who are all stable, she tells you the following. There's also a new admission that came in around 4 a.m. The senior admitted the patient, but I'm not sure where they are right now, they being the senior resident. I don't really know any details of the case. So you're walking back to your workroom and kind of waiting for the senior to come find you and give you sign out and a nurse pages you. You call back and are told to follow. Hi, are you taking care of this new admission? He is really sleepy and confused right now. I am getting very concerned. Can you come evaluate him? So when we did the in-person sessions, um, we did a series of think pair share activities and this is the first one. If you happen to find yourself with someone else right now, um, uh, definitely, you know, uh, work as a pair, but in the more likely scenario that you're by yourself watching these, um, just take, you know, a moment and pause um, the video. Uh, take 30 to 60 seconds to consider the following question. In one sentence or less, what is your first order of business in that room? In one sentence or less, what's your first order of business in that room? So take about 30 to 60 seconds. So what we're ultimately trying to get at here is your first order of business in that room is determining if the patient is sick versus not sick. Now, these um, terms are thrown around a lot. It's something that's expected of you, even as, as a medical student, it's something you're told you should be able to identify, but very few people actually define it. So this is how I define it. A patient is sick when emergent clinical intervention is required to preserve life or limb. Okay. Now, determining that a patient is sick is a pivotal moment in the case. On one hand, it's stressful because you have a sick patient, you have someone who could die, you have someone who could lose a limb. But in a way, I want it to be reassuring to you. Because when you determine that a patient is sick, your efforts and your attention shift from diagnosis to management. So the fact that um, this person has some exotic obscure final diagnosis is not as important as you, um, you know, addressing the fact that they're sick and stabilizing them. So um, you're, you're, you're shifting your focus to management. You may do some diagnostic things, but only um, as far as it will help you manage the patient appropriately. And when in doubt, um, you should call for help. So I would say this is especially true early in residency. But this probably holds true throughout the rest of your career. When you identify that you have a sick patient and it's just you and a nurse at the bedside, uh, it probably helps to have um, some, some other folks there too. So um, calling one of your, your co-residents when you're a senior resident, um, you know, um, talking with your attending or um, you know, even doing something like calling a rapid response and, and getting other people at the bedside who can help do things and also just to help you think. So uh, we have another think pair share activity. So I would like you to take another 30 to 60 seconds and consider the following question. 
what are two or three things that you can quickly look at to determine if a patient with acute encephalopathy is sick as we defined it? Just two to three things that you can quickly look at. So um, in our in-person sessions, there were a lot of um, kind of different things that came up. Um, a lot of folks mentioned looking at the ABCs, so airway, breathing, circulation, and kind of going hand in hand that with that a lot of people, people mentioned vital signs. So in this case, um, I shared with the group that um, blood pressure, respiratory rate, oxygen saturation are normal. So we may find out some more information that kind of uh, changes our mind and makes us think this person is sick. But based on this information, blood pressure, respiratory rate, oxygen saturation, heck, we'll even say the heart rate is normal as well. I think we can make a pretty safe assumption that this person is not sick as we defined it. So now that we've figured this out, I want everyone to take a moment and exhale because you do have time to think no matter how much chaos is going on in that room with um, you know, families, other healthcare providers, hospital staff, you have some time to think um, and you need to kind of get in the right headspace to do that. Um, you, it may be 15 minutes, it may be an hour, it may be days, but you have some time to think, okay? So another thing pairs your activity. So I want you to take 30 to 60 seconds to name three specific final diagnoses that have the potential to cause acute encephalopathy. I'm not talking about big broad categories like infection or metabolic. I'm saying what are three final diagnoses, billable, codable, that have the potential to cause acute encephalopathy. So when we were in the in-person sessions, um, people kind of had a variety of responses, hyponatremia, pneumonia, um, hypercalcemia, alcohol withdrawal, um, opioid overdose, so many different things. And I told everybody that on this slide, I actually comprised a comprehensive list on every single um, thing that can cause acute encephalopathy. And here it is. Any severe acute or systemic illness um, basically has the potential to cause acute encephalopathy. And the reason we kind of went through this whole exercise of naming a bunch of specific things and and then coming to the conclusion that, yeah, really anything can do it. It's, it's just to demonstrate that the shotgun approach of just listing a million things off that can cause acute encephalopathy is not a good use of your time. It's counterproductive. So I encourage you not to do it. With that being said, there's going to be times when it's first thing in the morning, it's the middle of the night, it's, you know, day seven or eight in a row working at the hospital, and you just want something to kind of grasp onto. So I just want to um, introduce or maybe even remind you of a diagnostic schema you might have heard of. It is the MIST mnemonic. Um, I don't know if these folks came up with it, but it has been popularized on the incredible, um, amazing uh, medical podcast, The Clinical Problem Solvers. Um, and so this is, this is an acronym. The M stands for metabolic. Um, again, so not a comprehensive list for you to memorize, but just kind of, um, you know, lay your eyes on. So um, problems with sodium, problems with calcium, kidney issues, liver issues, uh, problems with carbon dioxide or oxygen, thiamine B12 deficiency, thyroid disorders. Okay, so metabolic causes a fairly common group of etiologies that can cause acute encephalopathy. Infection. So sepsis of any etiology can cause um, um, uh, acute encephalopathy. What are common infections? Pneumonia is common. Um, UTIs are common. We talk about CNS infections. The classic teaching is that encephalitis um, is the kind of group of CNS infections that um, cause acute encephalopathy. But if someone's septic from meningitis, that can also cause acute encephalopathy. So just keep that in mind. Um, S stands for structural, also seizure. Um, and, and you know either like someone's having a seizure or um, they're postictal and then stroke. Um, we'll kind of mention this later. It takes a pretty specific kind of area of the brain to have a stroke um, to, to cause acute encephalopathy, but other structural causes. So subdural hemorrhage, um, mass lesions, um, increased intracranial pressure of any etiology. And then we have toxins. So alcohol, opioids, benzos, um, other illicit uh, substance intoxication or withdrawal, prescription medications. 
um, or over-the-counter medications um, with anticholinergic meds kind of being particularly bad actors in this arena. So where do we go from here? And um, I'll give you five, 10 seconds to recognize that this gentleman is casting a wide net. Um, so we, we want to talk about a tier one workup for acute encephalopathy, acute encephalopathy. So these are the things that we really want to be doing for pretty much anyone with acute encephalopathy. So in all patients, you want to get some history and you're specifically looking at their past medical history. So knowing what medical problems they already have, thinking about complications of those problems that can cause acute encephalopathy. You want to know their baseline mental status. I mean, if they're at their baseline mental status and nothing's really changed, you may, you may be done. Um, but if they're not at their baseline mental status, um, often the case, you, you want to know when they were last normal, because that will help you kind of um, get down to the, the etiology of things. You want to know what medications they're taking. So um, if um, I'm sure you've experienced the patient who's been admitted to the hospital who has 30, 40 medications kind of on their mar, and it's overwhelming. So I would focus on medications that are new, medications that were recently changed, things that were you know, started in the hospital, things that were stopped um, in the hospital. And then I would say like symptom medicines are another kind of big category, you know, pain medications, antiemetics, sleep aids, stuff like that, or um, can really um, cause some encephalopathy. Um, substance use history um, is an important thing to know. Travel history. So the only way that you're going to know um, in time that, uh, you know, there's some weird, um, you know, pathogen that's endemic to another part of the world or, you know, um, a particular outdoors you know, environment um, is knowing that the patient has been there. So focused exam. So uh, what I mean by that is uh, one, a neurological exam, you know, at least kind of a general head to toe neurological exam is, you know, going to be pretty high yield for you. And someone who has acute encephalopathy, uh, paying particular attention to the pupils and then looking for any tremor or asterixis. Um, and then on exam, looking for any signs of infection. So really kind of uh, junky sounding lungs, suggestive of pneumonia, super pubic tenderness, suggesting a UTI, um, you know, a big, you know, cellulitis on someone's like, don't want to miss that. Speaking of not wanting to miss, checking a point of your glucose, it's easy, it's quick, it's cheap. And, um, you know, you'll feel really silly in hindsight, working up someone for um, acute encephalopathy for, you know, an extended period of time, finding out they were hypoglycemic the whole time. And then uh, basic labs. So um, if these are already kind of pretty current, um, you don't necessarily have to repeat them, um, but making sure someone has like a current BMP, CBC kind of LFTs on, on, on file. Um, because I think even just these kind of basic labs can, can provide some signal for you to push you one way or the other. And I've said that a couple of times, like, uh, you know, using signal from your tier one workup. So what do I mean by that? So here I have some examples um, to kind of show you um, what that might look like. So um, say this was a 70 year old man with a history of um, an enlarged prostate. He was a little bit febrile, a little bit tachycardic, had a little bit of suprapubic abdominal pain, a little bit of leukocytosis, and then had an elevated creatinine, right? So now all of a sudden we're thinking this could be a UTI. Well, if this is a 42 year old woman with a history of substance use disorder brought in uh, for erratic behavior from a nearby bus stop. Okay, now kind of substance um, related issues kind of come to the forefront of our differential. What if this was an 81 year old man with uh, severe protein calorie malnutrition, cachectic and had a recent fall hit his head. Um, and now he has four out of five strength on his right side extremities. If this was a 59 year old woman with a past medical history of COPD and uh, she was tachypneic, she was a little hypoxemic, she wasn't moving very air very well um, on her lung auscultation, she had an expiratory root wheezes, you know, thinking hypercarbic respiratory failure. And finally, what if this was a 68 year old man with a past medical history of depression, C cell and allergies, um, went to his PCP recently and just started taking a bunch of new medications. So. That medical that medication history now becomes really important. So the key point here is use signal, just like in these cases, from your tier one workup to guide your tier two workup. So as we move to the tier two workup, I have a couple of pro tips that I'd like to share with you. One, be wary of encephalopathy mimickers. So um, someone has a sensory deficit, someone has dysarthria, someone has aphasia, someone has a language barrier. So all things that the person may look confused on the surface, but it's actually just one of these things. So don't miss this. 
Second, I just want to give you guys a comment about uh, brain imaging. So really we should be doing imaging of the brain, CT or um, MRI when you actually suspect a structural etiology or you suspect um, a stroke. And when we're talking about strokes, you know, this is really, um, we're suspecting a brainstem or thalamic stroke that is causing the ankyl encephalopathy. If you have a completely normal neurological exam with the exception of uh, mental status, um, that has a pretty strong negative predictive value for um, a structural etiology or a stroke. So not to say that you still can't make the decision to, to do that, but um, just, just have some actual clinical suspicion of these etiologies. And then a uh, quick comment about lumbar punctures. So, you know, people are often more gun shy of lumbar punctures than they should be. Um, and in many cases, that's okay with acute encephalopathy, um, you know, to kind of think methodically through things and, you know, do lumbar puncture, lumbar punctures in a non-urgent fashion. There are some instances though, where you should do an urgent lumbar puncture. So you should do the lumbar puncture at three o'clock in the morning. If you suspect a acute CNS infection, um, then you should be doing a lumbar puncture. And then, um, if you think someone has a subarachnoid hemorrhage, that's not being captured on the CT, um, head because of the, the time frame of it and you need to look for xanthochromia on the CSF, um, you should do an LP. However, uh, in the heat of the moment, don't forget the relative contraindications of increased intracranial pressure, uh, thrombocytopenia with platelets less than 50,000 and bleeding to athesis uh, with an INR less than 1.5. So um, again, relative contraindications, emergent situations are emergent, but um, really if these things are going on, you should have an extremely high threshold for doing an urgent LP. Some more tier two pro tips. So consider triggers for delirium not covered within the missed mnemonic. So, um, you know, think of the older frail patient with a lot of medical problems, things like pain, constipation, urinary retention, lines, tubes that are bothersome, um, disturbances in sleep wake cycle. These can be enough to kind of push someone over into the acute uh, into the acute encephalopathy arena. Um, primary psychiatric disorder. So a quick comment here. Um, even if they have been previously and professionally diagnosed by a psychiatrist, when you have someone who's acutely encephalopathic, their primary psychiatric disorder should be the diagnosis of exclusion. Um, so we want to treat folks with primary psychiatric disorders, just like any other patient, not miss the infection, not miss the metabolic derangement, not miss the structural etiology. And um, if the ultimate diagnosis is, yeah, they have acute psychosis, they have acute mania, they have some kind of atypical depression, um, that should be a diagnosis of exclusion. So let's go back to our case. So our patient is actually a 36 year old man with a past medical history of severe alcohol use disorder and prior illicit substance use. <clears throat> he has a baseline normal mental status. He does not take any prescribed or regular kind of over-the-counter medications. He lives in Denver, no recent travel. So he's been just in the Denver Metro. His vitals are notable for mild tachycardia. He is a little bit somnolent on exam with brief eye opening to sternal rub, two millimeter symmetric, but somewhat sluggish pupils, bilateral horizontal nystagmus, uh, but no rotary nystagmus or vertical nystagmus. Um, a little bit of scleral icterus, um, some mild epigastric and right upper quadrant tenderness to deep palpation without guarding, uh, rebound tenderness, rigidity. And then his neurological exam is otherwise unremarkable. So no tremor, asterixis, anything like that. And then our point of care glucose um, is 72. Labs um, show a sodium of 127, T-bill of 3.2, and AST a little bit up at 100, ALT a little bit up at 50. And then everything in else, um, including a CVC, um, is unremarkable. So uh, another think pair share activity. So take one, maybe two minutes and think about what are the three highest items on your differential diagnosis. And I'll put this slide back for you to um, look at. So your three items um, at the top of your differential in order. All right, now that we've got our differential, um, let's do our final think pair share activity. Um, take another one to two minutes to figure out what are the two to three diagnostic tests that you would order next. And not a trick question, um, the answer can be no, but are there any therapeutic interventions you would order at 
this time. Okay, so take one or two minutes for this one. All right, so um, when we were in the in-person se uh, sessions, I told everybody that, you know, um, what is on this next slide is what I ordered, um, not because it's right, not because it's wrong, um, but because I, the physician du jour, um, chose to order these things, and this is what happened. So um, I started the patient on IV thymine. I gave them peel lactulose. Now, um, some people were asking, how do you give lactulose in someone who's encephalopathic? Um, if the person is not responsive, they're not waking up, you don't just pour lactulose in their mouth and have them aspirate it. Um, you can, if you strongly suspect um, uh, hepatic encephalopathy, do um, uh, you know, uh, rectal lactulose. But in this case, we're just going to say that the nurse was able to wake up the patient, safely administer peel lactulose. Um, I placed the person on CWA monitoring. Um, I checked an INR, which was 1.1. Um, I... Um, checked an ethanol level, which is 100, kind of right around what we consider to be the legal limit in most states. And then a urine drug screen was positive for opioids. So you may be thinking at this point, wow, maybe those opioids are contributing um, to this person's acute encephalopathy. And if it is, um, maybe I want to give them a little bit of naloxone. So um, a few words about naloxone. So if someone is coding, if someone's about to code, if someone is about to die from an opioid overdose, by all means, do what you got to do. Give them naloxone, um, give them a lot of naloxone, save their life, ask for forgiveness later. Um, but we already determined, right, that this person is not, um, by our, um, by the way we define it, sick. Um, so uh, how do we want to give naloxone to this person? So um, uh, I just wanted to give you guys kind of a step-by-step -step process of how we give naloxone to a patient and if they're, they're still breathing, essentially. So we take our vial of naloxone, the one cc of it, and we um, actually mix it with nine milliliters of normal saline. So by my math, one cc plus nine cc's is 10 cc's. Then once we have our 10 cc's of <clears throat> this dilute solution, um, we can give one or two cc's of the dilute solution at a time over approximately one minute um, and carefully watch the patient's response. Then we keep doing this process until the patient opens their eyes and starts being responsive. Um, and then we're done. Um, you know, we don't need to keep giving them uh, naloxone, knock all those opioid um, uh, off the receptor and put them in a pain crisis or acute withdrawal. Um, however, if we keep doing it and we've, we've been two vials of Narcan or naloxone, I think at that point, you know, we either need to think about getting this person on a naloxone drip um, or we need to think, hey, this probably is an opioid and we need to think of something else. Quick comment about uh, naloxone drips. Um, the, the kind of dose um, of naloxone people are getting with a drip is, is quite a bit lower than um, pushes of naloxone. So if someone is having absolutely no response to the pushes of naloxone, um, you should be at least a little bit skeptical of, that, um, of the prospect of a naloxone drip kind of all of a sudden working, okay? But just use your clinical judgment. So let's uh, wrap up this case. So in our case, um, the patient got 0.2 milligrams or half a vial of naloxone before waking up and becoming responsive to the healthcare team. He spends the next three days in the hospital being treated for acute alcohol withdrawal and mild alcoholic hepatitis. He is evaluated by the Addiction Medicine Consult Service who discusses his alcohol and opioid use, provides community resources and prescribes medications at discharge. So a um, couple take home points for you from this talk. One, when you're confronting a person with acute encephalopathy, the first order of business is determining if the patient is sick or not sick. And if they're sick, you know, um, deal with that um, rather than, um, you know, the, the, the rabbit hole of, of some obscure diagnosis. Second, um, I want you to be able to use the misnomonic when you need or want to as a launch pad for your acute encephalopathy differential diagnosis. Um, third, I now want you to be able to cast a limited high yield net for your initial evaluation of all patients with undifferentiated acute encephalopathy. And last but not least, um, once you do that, I want you to use information gained from this initial evaluation, as we did in our case, to determine the next steps in your workup and treatment of acute encephalopathy. 
So with that, I thank you very much uh, for your time and for your attention and uh, good luck out there.